it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I took in lost children. Now they won't let me escape by the bored elegy. Have you heard of the urban legend of the black-eyed children? Well, some say they're extraterrestrial beings. Others claim they are just a myth. Or perhaps they're the lost souls of murdered children looking for vengeance. But, well, there I was being stared down by one threatening to stab me with a screwdriver. By this time I finally understood who or what they really are. I was about 24 years old when I'd taken up a job for house sitting. It was around dinner time that I'd arrived at the property of my friend's relative, an older man who lived with his nephews and had been quite paranoid since the burglary of his house. All I needed to do was to park my car in the lot turn on the lights, feed the fish, maybe water their hopeless plants, and well, relax for a few hours. I was looking forward to getting away from work for a while, so I couldn't pass up the opportunity of making pocket change at the same time. He let me borrow the house key, but it took me a while to fit it into the rusted old doorknob and undo the deadbolt. The owner had told me that the mosaic lamp on top of the piano had to be left on at all times, so... Despite how dark it was outside, I had no problem navigating where the light switch was. I was welcomed by the soft yellow light which beamed overhead from the flush mount ceiling lights through the entrance hallway. Creaks followed my footsteps as I arrived at the piano to feed the speckled red betta fish. Judging by the numerous toys and pristine cleanliness of the tank, it was the pride of the household and even had a sticker affixed to the front with the name Jerry written in Sharpie. After that, I nestled down onto the worn tweed sofa. The cushions were lumpy and uneven, as it seems each family member had their own designated spot. I laid the crocheted throw blanket across my lap and switched on the CRT television. It had been a while since I'd watched cable, but nothing interesting seemed to be playing, so I lay back and scrolled through my phone with the sound of jeopardy to keep me company. Not much time had passed until a piercing shriek electrified the air, followed by the harsh barking of a dog. The doorbell rang rapidly and the sound of knocking mingled with more screams. Help me, help me please, let me in, came a frantic voice from the other side of the door. I quickly answered, and a young girl tumbled in. Oh, and a large Rottweiler would have immediately burst in had I not slammed the door after her. It smacked against the wood with a loud thud and a whimper, followed by more vicious barking and snarling. In shock, I could only mutter the first sentence that came to mind. Yeah, are you alright? Instinctually, I grabbed her arm to help her up, but it was covered in warm, sticky blood. She recoiled in pain and snatched her arm away. Scratches covered her arms and face. Her knees were banged up with scrapes and rug burns. The little girl's face was red in panic and could barely speak through her panicked sobs. I led her into the living area, set her down on the sofa, and ran to the bathroom to fetch toilet tissues to hopefully stop the bleeding. Hey, what happened? I asked while dabbing the tissue. She whimpered, I only wanted to pet him. Oh, stupid kid, I muttered, shaking my head. You should know you're not supposed to pet random dogs just because... Uh... And I was immediately cut off by a strange sensation. The girl wasn't facing me, but I could tell there was something odd about her that I couldn't quite put my finger on. She seemed about... Seven to ten years old, and her light brown bangs were overgrown, obscuring her eyes almost entirely. After wrapping her arm like a mummy, I had her secure the paper in place. Wait, hold the tissue right there while I find bandages or something. In the bathroom, I ransacked the medicine cabinet in hopes of finding a first aid kit or something to better dress the wounds. Oh, God forbid it has rabies or something. Oh, I should probably call an ambulance, I murmured. Hey, you doing all right over there? 
I'm okay. I heard a sniff. Do you have a phone so I can call my daddy? I couldn't find any bandages, so I took an entire roll of toilet tissue from under the bathroom sink and a landline phone with me into the living area. The little girl dialed while I cleaned off the blood. Oddly enough, it didn't seem like the bites cut too deep, much less tear any skin, well, to warrant an emergency. Why was there so much blood? Hopefully her folks could get her to a doctor to at least look at it. Hello? Uh, hello? Her face fell as she hung up. He didn't answer. Why didn't you leave a message? I inquired. Some scary lady said, Mailbox is full. Goodbye. The girl handed the receiver back to me. But when I looked down at it, the phone appeared to be dead and completely depleted of battery power. I fished my smartphone out of my pocket but was interrupted by another knock at the door before unlocking the screen. Oh, thank goodness. It must be her parents looking for her. I left the little girl in the living room and opened the door only to find a teenage girl waiting outside. She looked similar to the one who was attacked, so she must be her older sister. Oh, hi. Are you, uh... I began to ask. I'm lost, she interrupted with a blank expression. Can I use your phone? Her face was entirely emotionless with this monotone voice. She was pale as a sheet with rosy cheeks and dark circles under her eyes. Hunched over in fatigue, she was panting as if she'd been walking for miles. Before I could say anything, she'd invited herself inside and seated herself at the bottom of the stairwell. The girl leaned onto the ornate wooden banister and closed her eyes. But first, can I please have something to drink? Squinting and crossing my arms, annoyed, I was wary of this runaway teenager. Oh, and, um, who do you think you are that you can just waltz into a stranger's house like you own it? She shook her head without opening her eyes. I stood in place, expecting a reply. There was already one distressed child in the living room, and the last thing I wanted was for the owner to unexpectedly return and to think I'd suddenly decided to open a daycare at his home while he was away. Well, I pressed. Teenage girl sat up and rubbed her eyes. Well, there is a statue of St. Joseph outside. Mom taught me that if I was ever lost or in trouble, the statue was a good sign of a safe place to go. I relaxed my arms and slowly closed the door. My mother had given me the same advice growing up. It had been a long time since then, but I remember her telling me that St. Joseph was the patron saint of fathers and houses. Well, I'd been in the same position once, and I wished I'd been able to have the same fortune. Went into the kitchen and fetched her a clear plastic cup with cold tap water. But when she looked up to me and to return the empty glass, a chill ran down my spine. Her irises were almost non-existent, and her large pupils became a darkened abyss that absorbed all color. I found myself being drawn in, almost hypnotized as an uneasy sensation bloomed in the pit of my chest. My peripheral vision became increasingly hazy, and before being sucked in, I quickly snatched my gaze away. But other than that, well, she seemed completely normal. Who's there? Asked the little girl in the living room. Is that daddy? She wandered into the hallway and looked at the other girl. She'd brushed her overgrown bangs out of her face, but her eyes were still shaded. They didn't speak a word to each other, only staring intently. Still in a jittery panic, I broke up the two girls. All right, why don't we go to the living room and I'll call both your parents, I directed. They both followed me to the couch. The first girl decided to sit on the carpeted floor while the second laid across the faded plaid lounger chair. I unlocked my phone and directed my attention to the older girl. So, uh, what did you say your name was again? I asked. For some odd reason, I believed the sooner she could leave, the better. No. Response. She was already fast asleep. 
I suppose I'd try again when she wakes up. And so I directed the same question at the younger child. Well, my name is Bella, she said. I tried to hide my smile. What's so funny? Bella asked. Oh, <laughs> it's nothing, I chuckled. Bella was a nickname I hadn't heard since I was very young, but nowadays I'm always just Annabella. She forced a smile as I asked her for a phone number. I set the call to speakerphone and pointed the receiver in her direction. We're sorry. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please hang up or check the number and dial again. And Bella seemed to be frightened by the automated voice. I gently reassured her and asked her to reiterate the number. I put the phone to my ear just in case we'd get another dead end. And I was met with the same automatic message. We're sorry. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please hang up or check the number and dial again. Well, the girl started to tear up. Oh, I don't think Daddy wants to talk to me. He never does. Oh, is there anyone else you can call? I mean, your mom, or your grandparents. She shook her head. Mommy moved away and I don't know Nana's phone number. Oh, she lives so far away. I was growing concerned. How could she not know basic emergency contacts? I worried that I'd end up needing to take her to the police station to identify her and hopefully get medical attention. But that would be after I figured out what to do with the other girl on the lounge chair. Couldn't just leave her here to bring Bella to the station. She never told me her name, and I concluded that I'd have to wake her up before I could get anywhere. Gripping her shoulder, I jostled her awake. She groaned with a displeased expression. It's your turn, I interrogated. Watch your phone number so your parents can come pick you up. I don't... I don't have a home, she said hesitantly. Well, then where are you from? There must be someone I can call, I pressed. She rubbed the sleep out of her droopy eyes and sat upright. Actually, well, there is someone. Here, give me. By how abruptly the older girl clawed at my phone, I couldn't help but instinctively snatch it away. So far, I was put off by her overbearingly intrusive attitude, but, at a second glance, my eyes fell on a purple bruise on her jaw, scratches in between her eyebrows and the deep tear in her lower lip. Oh, there must be a reason why she would be wandering around by herself. I decided to soften my tone. Oh, I'll dial, and then I'll let you have it to talk, okay? I assured her. Oh, it'll be really quick, she stated. The sooner I call, the sooner you can get rid of me. On hearing that, a woeful shame washed over me for being so abrasive. All right, I sighed. Before that, can I at least have your name? She pretended not to hear me. After realizing she wouldn't have the phone until I had an answer, she sighed. Serena. I unlocked the screen then and handed it to her. The teen began to walk away into the hall with the speaker to her ear and I grew more tempted to eavesdrop. Hey, Serena said in a low tone. Yeah, I finally did it. The air conditioning units clicked on and her conversation was partially drowned by the dense whirring of the air vents. Well, I'm pretty sure you eventually noticed because I need you to come get me. At the same time, I was watching Bella replacing the tissue on her arms, and fortunately the bleeding seemed to have nearly stopped completely. Serena returned, handing the phone back to me. Oh, it died, she announced. I stretched the corners of my mouth in annoyance. Of course, this had to be the only time I left my charger in my apartment. I'd only been expecting to stay for a few hours, and definitely not this late. So, um, is someone coming to get you? I inquired, avoiding her gaze. She nodded. Yeah, they should be here in a few. Sighing, I leaned my head to one side. I could swear I was alright with battery life before. Oh, I suppose the only thing to do was to wait. Serena sat at the dining room table, 
produced a journal and pen from a backpack and set to writing while Bela gazed into the fish tank on the piano. Jerry the better fish came out of hiding and swam directly in front of her nose, staring intently. I suppose I should have probably ordered a pizza for the two girls while they waited for Serena's ride, and so I picked up the landline phone. Oh yeah, it's also dead from when Bella used it, that's right. And so I returned it to the mount in the hallway. I was apprehensive about the idea of looking into a stranger's refrigerator instead, but it seemed like Serena didn't believe the same. Hey, I shouted, what do you think you're doing? Like a bandit caught in the act, she already had a container of ham, a loaf of bread and mayo in hand. I haven't eaten in three days, she stated flatly. The girl was testing my ability to choose my battles. I decided that I'd simply replace everything tomorrow. So returning to Bella, I asked her if her wounds were okay and if she wanted something to eat as well. I simply couldn't let any one of the girls eat and not the other. Well, as Bella ran ahead of me into the kitchen, I turned my head toward the tank only to find the upturned better fish floating at the top. Bella grabbed half of the freshly cut sandwich sitting on the counter and started to nibble at the corner, only for Serena to immediately rush over, snatch it out of her hand and smack her across the head. The force knocked the little girl down, and in defense, I shoved Serena into the wall. What the hell is wrong with you? I screamed. What was that for? She stayed quiet, just like always. I threatened her to give me an explanation or that I'd kick her out of the house. The younger ones have to learn a lesson. Don't mess with me or get out of the way, she started. My eyes widened in shock. Who told you that? She remained silent and returned to the table. Serena opened her journal and hung her head low. In the corner of my eye, Bella entered the dining room with a plate in hand. I shook my head at her and silently shooed her off. I studied the journal closely from across the table. I'd had one just like it growing up, where I wrote everything from my feelings, an account of the day, to short poems and stories. But this one, this one seemed familiar. I took a seat and watched her closely. Her eyebrows furrowed as she leaned the book upward in an effort to hide what she was writing. The cover had the same embossed floral print as the one I'd had at her age. Well, Serena, right? I said in a softer tone. She nodded her head. I stated, Your name is, um, Serena... Simmons? She clapped the book closed and glared. No. I reached across and snatched the journal away. Quickly leafing through the pages, each was signed Serena Simmons. Serena Simmons. Serena Simmons. At the beginning entries, something else had been erased only to be replaced by the name. She rushed around the table and I voluntarily handed the journal back. This time I had the courage to look her into the eyes. Your name, your real name is not Serena Simmons, is it? Newly found fear re-entered my chest, causing another chill to spiral down my spine. But I refused to release her from my gaze. Yes it is, she screamed as the color flushed out of her face. I shook my head. I suddenly understood why her eyes had such an effect. The name Serena Simmons was a fake name I'd made up the night I ran away from home when I was only 14. Her eyes were a mirror image that reflected the abyss back at me. Who told you the younger had to be taught a lesson? I began. Your father told you that too, didn't he? She shut her eyes and threatened to lunge at me, but the sound of loud sobbing interrupted our attention. I rose from the table and rushed to the living area. Bella's arms and legs were profusely bleeding, almost as if they were newly opened, tripping into a pool on the carpet around her, and her sobs rose into agonizing screams. Go get the phone, I ordered Serena. I need you to call an ambulance. 
She rushed out of the room as I tried to calm Bella down while trying to stop the bleeding. I, I need you to look at me, I said, forcing a calm demeanor. Shh, don't look at your arms or legs, just look at me. Staring deeply into her eyes, she began to calm down. And just like Serena, I faced the void that had been waiting for me, threatening to swallow me whole. Her eyes squeezed shut and she began sobbing even louder. Serena returned with the phone, but for some reason the battery was still dead. Shut up, Serena screamed as she wrapped her hands around Bella's throat. Quit your damn screaming. I grabbed Serena off of her, wrestling her to the floor. She proved to be just as strong as I was, though, and we struggled back and forth for the upper hand. By the time she was sitting atop my chest, Bella had begun to scurry upstairs. And as soon as Serena noticed, she immediately chased after her. I grabbed her by the ankle, tripped her, and she began kicking my face with her other foot. Refusing to let go, I grabbed hold of the other foot and pinned her down on top of her back. My arm snaked around her throat, and I began to squeeze until she couldn't fight any more. Her face turned blue as her eyes closed and I leaned her limp body against the wall. I made my way up the staircase then, in search of Bella. The crimson trail of blood led to the only closed bedroom door on the upper floor. I slowly entered and turned on the light switch, barely illuminating the room with a single blue fluorescent desk lamp. She was no longer sobbing, only weakly fighting to keep her eyes open. Blood was spilling from every orifice on her face. Her shirt and shorts were drenched. I held onto her hand and leaned her head to my chest. Daddy, she murmured. I want my daddy. I whispered in her ear. I'm so sorry, Annabella. You're not old enough to understand. The whites of her eyes became entirely blackened and she finally stopped breathing. In my own reflection in her eyes, there I was with long, overgrown bangs all those years ago. I saw myself as her again. Oh, if only someone had been there for me at the time. The door swung open suddenly as the teenaged Annabella burst into the room. Her eyes were also blackened out entirely. How could you? She shrieked as tears ran down her face. How could you let her die? A glint came from her hand. She was holding a screwdriver. I'm not sure where she got it, but I certainly didn't want to know what she planned to do with it. All I wanted was to feel safe, she sobbed. I wanted him to leave me alone again. Why would you ruin it by going back? Then she swung at me with the screwdriver and nearly pierced my throat. I shoved her aside and bolted out the door. Annabella tumbled down the stairs after me, grabbed my shirt, and I caught her by the wrist that was holding the weapon. I struggled and fought to get to the front doorway and clawed at the lock with my free hand. As I undid the deadbolt, there was another knocking from the other side. Instantly, the teen loosened her grip and the fight came to a pause. She let go of me and scampered far away from the door, eyes wide and trembling. I checked the peephole. But there wasn't anyone there. Another knock came from the door as I rushed to the window. Still, I couldn't see anyone outside. I turned back toward where teenage Annabella was, only to find that she disappeared. I heard one of the closet doors violently shut. She was hiding, just like I used to. <sighs> Who's out there? I shouted. Bella? said a familiar voice from the other side. What are you doing here? My heart skipped a beat as I shrieked. Dad, how did you find me? The lower lock suddenly became undone. I then leaned onto the door and quickly reinforced it again. How are you doing that? I realized that this was the final frontier of where the abyss had led me. Get away from me, or I'm calling the police. Well, that's no way to greet your father, he barked. You think you'd just leave me? When I fed you and put a roof over your head? 
open this damn door. Well, the lock somehow became undone again, and I fought against the door being kicked open with all my strength. The kicks became increasingly more violent, and I wasn't sure if I could hold on much longer. The blooming fear had flowered into a blackened dread. The door swung open, and I was violently shoved aside. A murky flood gushed into the house that nearly swept me away. I bolted toward the stairway as the waters began to race faster and faster up the stairs. I scrambled toward the bedroom windows, only to find a black ocean as far as the eye could see. More water began to gush past my knees, and I sloshed towards the opening to the attic. The cord opened the hatch as the ladder unfolded itself. Long metal nails protruded through the ceiling, every few inches like an iron maiden. In complete darkness, I crawled over boxes and bins littered in the attic in a desperate search for an opening to the roof. As the cold water began to cover the floor, I realized the search was futile. The flood rose ever higher, first up to my wrists and knees, along my chest and then up my back. I'd gotten so far, and the roof was even lower than ever, and I could no longer hold my head up any higher. As I sunk under, my mind played through memories with only two voices standing out from the rest. So... You ran away from home as a teen? The first asked. Yes, but I was trying to go to my mother's house, I replied. I made up her name and tried to make it on my own. But he found me and forced me to go back with him. All so I could work and start paying half of the expenses. Until I was eventually the only one paying for everything. So I finally put my foot down and moved states. I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh. I've come to terms with it, but no matter where I go, or where life takes me, it seems the past will haunt me until the day I die. So a weird and wonderful Black Eyed Kids story there for you, for your Tuesday evening's entertainment. Yeah, that's right, it's Tuesday. Don't usually read stories on a Tuesday, but things are a bit quiet around here and at work, so why the hell not, I thought. <laughs> so yeah, a short and sweet one there for your Tuesday evening's entertainment. Uh, weird, wonderful, bit creepy as well. Uh, very glad to read a first-time author's story for you this evening. Well, back again tomorrow. Probably something a bit longer, but... For this evening, that's probably enough, isn't it? Yeah? Till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dream. Some bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter... Instagram, you can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye bye.